losing weight. I think that was the biggest thing, like losing weight like crazy. So I lost nearly, I think it was around 10 kilos from the point of like at beginning of 2020 to when I was diagnosed in finally in December, really gaunt, frail, um, and looking horrible. It's going to be pretty rough, but the more you, you ingest gluten, it's going to get a bit easier. And I had to ramp it up. Um, for like, yeah, it was like six or seven weeks in the lead up to the endoscopy. I had experience with something and then someone might, um, you know, say otherwise. And I've found this happens so many times. Like I've been to restaurants where I've had a really great experience and then someone will go there and say, they didn't really, you know, understand like gluten or like, you know, they didn't understand the cross-contamination aspects mm. of the restaurant. And I, might, and I might say like, oh, that's so weird. Like they were so good with me and they explained everything, but different staff can, you know, change. They can have different owners come in. Um, so it, and it's a really difficult space to be in as well. Favor and click follow or subscribe button. It helps the podcast out so much. Hello and welcome to another episode on the Make and Same podcast. So I'm joined by Ben Hampton. How are you doing today? Yeah, good man. Yeah, it's um yeah nighttime here and um yeah morning there. So it's uh yeah it's just cool to speak to you and thanks for having me on, man. I know it's always tricky trying to kind of record with someone like when obviously someone's based in Australia and trying to work out like the time differences. Whereabouts in Australia are you from then? Yeah, the Southern Highlands in uh, New South Wales, Australia. So it's um like kind of in between Sydney and Canberra, right smack bang in the middle there, uh, like two hours drive uh, from both. Yeah. Are you, are you originally, are you born there as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I was born pretty much in the town next to the town that I'm in now. Um, and yeah, so yeah. I have moved around a fair bit in the past and, um, yeah, done a lot of different stuff in my life, but have found myself back here and, uh, yeah, settled down with a high school sweetheart. It's kind of that like, old story of the, um, yeah, the high school sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, we've got a couple of girls and, uh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Back, um, pretty much near where I grew up. So. And it's incredible to have you on Ben. Obviously you obviously got a gluten free podcast and it's great to obviously hear from kind of a male perspective as well. Obviously he's kind of sharing your experiences because I think you can completely get it. Even in the allergy community, there's not many kind of male guys kind of talking openly about the kind of the emotions and obviously diagnosis that the listeners, could you share a little bit about your kind of your page and your podcast? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, my Instagram page is a gluten-free family. Um, and I started that up uh, at the, I think it was uh, not long after my celiac diagnosis, or even when I got my positive blood test from that. And uh, it was during <laughs> lockdown, um, it, during COVID. So it was just a way for me to sort of connect with other people going through similar stuff. And it was my wife's idea to start up an Instagram page. And I was like, hell no, um, I have no idea how to run Instagram. <laughs> Like I'm not very good, you know, with technology and the social media apps and stuff, but she sort of forced me into it. And, um, as the best thing, one of the best things I've ever done, just, you know, connecting with heaps of other people going through a similar journey. Um, and hence why I just started, you know, chatting to so many people and hearing their journeys and what they'd been through and, uh, just realizing how much more awareness is needed about celiac disease and the gluten-free diet in general. Um, so I thought, you know, there's a few people sort of doing a podcast in this sort of space, but I thought, as you said, at the top of the episode, they're like, there's not many male voices in this sort of area. And to sort of just break that stigma of guys not talking about, you know, allergies or, um, you know, autoimmune diseases, like, why not? Like, <laughs> you, why shouldn't we, you know, we're starting to talk a bit yeah. more about mental health and that side of things and physical health, um, and so I thought I'd just sort of incorporate a podcast about that and share my own journey and get other people on to hear about theirs. Is, is in any kind of male um, advocates within the kind of celiac space? Because I, I think I'm only aware of yourself, to be honest. Yeah, there's a fair few. Uh, there's a fair few online. Um, oh, there's Phil. Not- yeah, this Phil I've had on, I just remembered. It's like, yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. Had had him on my podcast too. Phil's awesome. He's um, raising some you know, serious awareness for the disease, and in a really, um, you know, like a funny way too. Just getting people engaged, and like the videos that he does is really fun. But it's also raising awareness too for the gluten free diet, and to you know subtly 
show how hard it is to be, you know, following a strict gluten-free diet. If you don't have celiac disease, if you're following it for other reasons, um, I've actually got one of your stickers right here. <laughs> Make gluten-free bread bigger. Oh, really? Just got it on the laptop. Um, Bert Brunden. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's, he's awesome. Um, and he's, I had to learn, I'm learning so many different words that people have like different conditions. So I think I nailed it. Eosinophilic esophagitis, EOE, where he has like a, um, uh, it's what it, it wasn't an autoimmune disease. I remember he said it's like a autoimmune condition. Um, so like where he gets food mm. stuck in the, in the throat and, um, an adverse reaction to gluten and some other, um, allergies. So super interesting to just connect with different people and hear about their conditions and what they're going through. And, um, as I'm sure we'll talk about it, you cross paths with, you know, people suffering different, um, different health issues in, in the celiac and gluten-free space or in the allergy community. Yeah. It all sort of, you know, crosses paths. Uh, um, come together. Yeah. If, if we think back to them kind of early years, you've kind of spoke about previously, like before you got diagnosed, this kind of like brain fog and not being able to kind of like think straight. When, when, when you think back to them early years, then do you think there's definitely signs and symptoms Obviously, you wasn't aware you you had so yet. Yeah, I think I should have been screened really early on. Um, and like, you know, everything in hindsight, right? Like looking back, you're like, oh, well, you know, this should have been done. That should have been done. But I guess, you know, there's still a lack of awareness about celiac disease out there. Um, and especially in Australia, but all over the world, really. Uh, and because I believe because it's not on regular blood tests, and I think when it is on regular blood tests in the future, it'll be picked up way more. And I'm looking forward to that day when it actually is. Um, but I, yeah, I should have been screened when I was a kid for sure. Like I can remember so many days just rocking up to school and like not being able to focus whatsoever. The teacher would be talking and I'd just be seeing their mouth move. And I'd just be sort of like sitting there blank faced. Um, and I remember my mom actually told me, she was going to go get me tested for a whole bunch of stuff, um, like neurological conditions. Um, I remember at one stage, uh, they thought I had a brain tumor. I can remember this big discussion when I was quite young, Oh wow! just sort of, you know, my parents having this, you know, big argument in, um, in the living room or something. And like me walking in on that and just sort of like, they were, you know, like the, you know, a brain tumor got like tossed around in the, in the conversation, but my mom was going to get me tested for like ADD, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff and they never did. Um, but I think if I, yeah, got tested for celiac, especially, um, early on, it probably would have changed the course of a lot of mental health issues that I have, um, dealt with going, going forward in my life. But, um, glad I had a diagnosis at least, you know, somewhere along the track. It didn't happen until many years later, but, uh, yeah, still glad for the diagnosis and to be able to sort of change things once that happened. Yeah, I can imagine obviously getting that diagnosis, a lot of things kind of make sense when you kind of look back at the dots kind of thing. You kind of mentioned there obviously like mental health struggles. Is that something you kind of, you faced um, when you were younger? And I think it's something I've been more open about, obviously definitely on the podcast. And I mean, I've, I've openly kind of spoke about my mental issue is like anxiety and that obviously that kind of stems from um, allergies, but also it stems into everyday life now by having that anxiety, mm -hmm. not knowing when I'm, I'm next going to have an allergic reaction. And um, it's interesting. It's not something I've learned until obviously getting therapy and kind of um, looking back. Was that something you kind of experienced when you were younger? Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, I had some friends going through some, like, uh, like really tough, um, you know, mentally, mentally challenging, um, things in their life and having, you know, um, mental health diagnoses down the track and like sort of seeing that road. Um, I guess it's sort of like scared me in a way. And, and, and there was always this sort of stigma, you know, like if you were feeling a bit down or if you, you know, weren't feeling quite right in front of people or feeling socially awkward or that sort of thing. It was always put down to what I can remember is like, you've got to kind of get over that. 
Like you have to like toughen up, mm. uh, especially if you're a guy. It's like, you can't, you can't yeah. be like, you know, you can't have anxiety or depression. You got to get out there on the, like the footy field and yeah. just, you know, go out for the, you know, beers with your mates and forget about that, you know, mental health stuff that can wait. You go out and party and you, you know, get all the girls and you like, you know, you focus on that sort of thing. It was never like your mental health is a really serious thing, you know, <laughs> to take care of and you have to nurture that and you have to treat it like your physical health. Um, and that's changing now for the better, for sure. But yeah, growing up, it was sort of, um, yeah, pretty much just that really masculine, uh, mentality. I don't know what it's like there, you know, if it's much different in the UK, but, um, yeah, growing up in Australia, especially it was a real macho, crowd where you know you would go out and okay get on the drinks all the time with your mates and you know not really talk about the mental health side of stuff like if you did then you were sort of you know labels were put on you and you were sort of you know made to feel like a bit like an outcast um and so i never really did talk about my mental health and didn't really have many chats with my mates unfortunately about their mental health when i really really should have um, and seen some friends go down some bad paths because of that, uh, turned to other things. And, um, yeah, it's so unfortunate that we're, you know, we didn't talk openly about it and didn't feel comfortable to talk about it too. Yeah. It's interesting that because I think when I started one of my like, site second jobs in London, when it, one of my, um, friends, like he opened like day one was like, oh, I, I'm on antidepressants. And was and it was really a bit like, I mean, it was amazing to see as well, like, cause I never seen someone so open about it. And I've seen a shift definitely with my friends, like back at home, I've got one friend who's like super, super open about his emotions and his feelings. And I've got another friend who is a bit more closed off about his emotions and is a bit more like Jack the Lad, you could be like a bit more like jokey kind of thing and, and never really kind of would say how he feels, but I've seen a shift where like he's now more open to kind of say how he feels and, and, and he's, and, and it's great to see as well. Cause the last thing I would want is like for a guy to be going through like a really like tough time and he feels like he can't turn around to me and be like, Oh, this is how I feel. So it's great to see that there is, there's definitely been more of a shift with guys feeling more open to kind of talk about their emotions. And yeah, I'm, I'm definitely like a bit of an open book. But I think it's interesting once you will open up to another guy, you find like mm. they they completely open up to you. I think I think it's just making that first first move in some ways. Like I think like when I've been on nights out before and I've been open about therapy, for example, you'd be surprised at the response. A lot of guys are oh like, oh, I've been thinking about that. Oh, and and I think it's just like having that conversation, it can really open up someone's like horizon in some ways. Absolutely. And I think One thing that I've been thinking about recently is that there's so much talk on like people opening up and being like really open about their mental health and and doing, you know, all that work on themselves and, and, and making situations where they can feel safe to speak in front of other people, but there isn't much attention given to like the person receiving it. Do you know what I mean? Like sitting there and like offering a safe space for those people to talk and just listening and I guess like that, I'm sure we'll get into it, but that is one thing that I have definitely learned from starting the podcast. And one of the things that are like, I am so thankful for just, you know, no matter what happens in my life and what happens with the podcast or anything, I think that is one thing that I've learned is just to sit with someone and listen to them and their story and to like truly listen to some, what someone is saying. It's so powerful when you do, because often people are just waiting for their like next turn to, to talk about something. But when you like just sit Mm. there and you're like, you you take it on board um, and you can, you know, you feel heard. Then that's when I think someone can feel safe to go back and speak to that person and choose them to open up about something. Um, And I've found those people in my life luckily now and like love them to death, you know, like um, it's, I wouldn't be here without them. So um, yeah. I think it's um yeah super important to to have those conversations and for yeah for the other person to feel you know like um they can listen to it they can sit with it and not sort of like you know offer advice and fix everything straight away just go like 
you know, just to <laughs> take it on board and to, to acknowledge that it's really hard for that person. And you sometimes don't even need to say anything in response. You can just sit there and, and listen. And that is enough for that person to feel like, oh, okay, like I have been heard. Do you think, I, I was thinking this the other day, I was at a, a 30th in um, Dublin in Ireland and I was speaking to someone and um, we were talking about the podcast and we got onto the topic of like getting people to like open up to you. And there's a bit of a, a skill in it in some ways. And I think by having the podcast without unintentionally, I'll be speaking to someone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be getting out like and they're like really up and up to me and you're like oh where's that come from but then you just do it unintentionally because you're so just through speaking to so many different people from all different backgrounds and cultures and everything like it's like finding what is that that key interest you both have and then you, and I feel like if you can find that common interest with someone it's very easy then to forget them to feel settled for them to kind of open up to you do you do you, do you see that as do you feel that as well obviously having a podcast and then just speaking with people it's, it's, I don't know, it's different. I'm quite, I feel like I'm a quite deep person anyway, but I think then speaking to people, like they kind of open up to you more without you intentionally purposely trying to get them to show their emotions. Like. I feel exactly the same. I was actually having a chat to my wife about this the other day. I don't know what it is like, uh, like about me. Like, I think I am quite a deep person as well. And I'm just curious. I'm so fascinated by people and their stories and what yeah. they're going through. And like, um, I just love, I probably should have been a psychologist or something like I just love, you know, <laughs> hearing people's stories and getting in their brains and just figuring out why they're doing what they're doing and making the decisions that they're making. Um, I don't know what that is and why I, you know, am so attracted to that, but I, yeah, I, I just love having conversations with the people and learning stuff. Um, and yeah, I was speaking to my wife about it the other night. Like, I don't know what it is, but some people just, they just choose to just tell me like everything up front. Like even people who I've just met, they just come up and, and I guess it's like just a safe space for them to talk. And I'm totally happy with that. Like, uh, like I'm happy to, you know, mm. sit there and listen to people, um, you know, to a, to a degree, if it gets too much, then, um, you know, and it has yeah. to be sort of the correct, you know, environment and space for that to happen. But yeah, I love speaking to people, hence why I started the podcast. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think yeah, you've got it like nailed on the head. Like when you've generally got like an interest in someone and, and you want to actually, like, like, say you're so curious, you want to find out more about them. Like, I think people I can see that as well. Like obviously it's not fake. It's literally like I'm generally wanna yeah. find out about your story of how you got from like A to B. I was gonna say with 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 the um on the topic on the podcast whilst we're on it, I used to I used to write questions of like notes. Now I don't I, I do as much research as I can then go into it kind of open minded. What is your process when interviewing a guest? Yeah, I still have a bunch of questions. Um I still write them out. I still suffer from a fair bit of brain fog. So I'm worried that I will lose track. And I, I think I more do that for the guest purpose. Like I don't want them to feel like, you know, um, I don't have like, you know, something ready to go and like, and a question ready to mm -hmm. go. But I've actually found that just recently, like I'm more happy to just go off the cuff and to go off in, you know, different directions because, I think that is just conversation, right? Like we're speaking right now, like we'll probably go off in a different direction soon and just to like sort of follow that, but to have like a rough guide of where you want it to go, um, it, like a template of <laughs> sort of in my mind of where mm. I want it to go. And I've done a bit of like background research yeah. on them um, and I'm happy to just take it wherever they want to take it because where I initially thought it might go, it might just go in a completely different direction. And I found that, you know, I used to be like really afraid of the awkward silences, like to leave a bit of a silence, but I found that, you know, like often leaving the, the person to feel like they can talk, like you're so good at it. They're just speaking to you right now. You're, you're very good at um, just sitting there and, and listening. And I think that just provides a space for people to just continue and to just, you know, talk about what they want to talk about. And I think um, that's something I've learned just, you know, an interviewing skill along the way, which is uh, probably one of the, the best <laughs> um, things that I've learned by trial and error. Yeah. And has, has, it, has it ever been like, um, a podcast which has really kind of maybe opened up your mind to some or really kind of left left you with a certain feeling like is there, is there any podcast you've done before where 
because I've had a few where it's it's like oh my god like for example I had one with um Natasha's family and they were talking about um Natasha who died from the pret sandwich and I had, uh, I had a mum and dad on the podcast mm. and the dad was like speaking about like what happened on the plane when she went to anaphylactic shock and like that had to break her ribs and it was honestly like like it was so emotional um mm. and I got back and I like broke down in tears because it, it it was just a lot to take in um because you're so used to seeing like a snippet of someone's story has, has it been like a podcast where it's really kind of like opened up your mind um or had like a, an, an effect on you uh yeah great question man. <laughs> um yeah yeah a couple uh recently actually I um had a psychologist on and uh, we chatted about the mental health aspects of living with celiac disease and following a gluten-free diet. And uh, basically everything that she was talking about was um, just, just blew my mind. Basically it was um, a really, really interesting chat. And she's, yeah, Juliet Thompson is her name. Um, she's a psychologist and she specializes in eating disorders and body image. And a lot of the things that she was talking about um, just was just amazing and applied to a lot of the things that I was going through and answered a lot of my own questions. And I think, you know, they say that, you know, people write books um, to sort of like write the book that they would want to read. And I often think that, you know, I'm doing this podcast because it's something that I would want to hear if I, I never created this podcast. And that was one episode where I was like, wow, like everything she is saying is just, uh, you know, really, really applying to, to what I'm going through. Um, and also doing, I did a children's special. I sort of went all out. I was going to make it like sort of this hour special, um, and maybe do like a one or two parter. And it turned out to be like a four parter, um, during, um, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, during celiac disease, uh, awareness day that in the lead up to that, uh, back in May. And I interviewed parents of, kids diagnosed with celiac disease and that really really affected me because i'm a parent of two young girls and uh to hear their stories i did my first interview and i was like i can't do this this is i'm gonna be i, I had a chat to my wife after i did the first interview and i was just mm. in tears and i was like um i can't i can't go ahead with this um i think i've you know bitten off more than i could chew um because I just kept on thinking like too, you know, too much to take on. Is it a bit too close to home? Would you say? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like my, my two girls could have it, um, either one of them, um, in the future and not to say that, you know, they can't have a fantastic life with celiac disease. Like it, it can, you know, you can still have a fantastic life with it. It's just, um, the, the lead up to the diagnosis and hearing them, you know, go for checkups and blood tests and, uh, and knowing the life that I need to lead now, um, I just, I wouldn't wish it upon anybody, you know, and especially my kids. But I know, and I say this, you know, after speaking to so many parents that, you know, they have a chance to spread awareness about this disease. And although, you know, it's a hard thing to go through and they have to go through a lot of struggles, you know, kids go through heaps of struggles in, in life, no matter what. And, um, this is just one more thing that they would just, you know, have to deal with. And so many of them become resilient and strong because of it. But that was one where, you know, speaking to the parents and hearing them open up about that they, with their kids and the testing and how they transitioned with school life and, you know, home life and, um, and with their friends and going out to parties and how that just changed the, their entire world. That just deeply, deeply affected me. And it was actually a really, really hard, um, really hard thing to put together. And I, I really struggled with it. Actually, it was like, I put a lot of effort into it and I made it sort of like a documentary sort of style. So it was much more than I usually Amazing. do with my normal guest episodes. Um, but it was super hard to put together. And I thought I, I honestly had a bit of a, um, I had to take a bit of a breather after that just to, you know, sort of sit with that for a little bit because it was just, it was a lot. And I'm sure that you found this just, you know, interviewing guests that like you're listening to so much of their story and they're opening up to you on such a deep level. And it's sort of a lot to, to take in. Um, although it's fantastic and I love it. It's just, it is a lot. 
um, and to just sort of have some ways to deal with that, I think is, is super important as well. No, I completely resonate with that. And yeah, I've, I think have an analogy when, when you speak about it all the time and then like you say, you're getting guests on and they're talking about their allergic reactions or going to anaphylaxis. It, for me, I think you take a lot of that anxiety on as well. Mm. And it can be really hard sometimes because obviously I want to share people's story to kind of educate and inspire and everything else which goes alongside that but also the anxiety and the toll um because at the minute my anxiety has been really bad and I thought like, if I keep talking about allergies all the time it's only going to make it kind of worse is that something you experience obviously being like celiac like is it do, do you experience like when you hear about like say other people's stories that kind of takes a kind of mental toll on your mental health as well yes a hundred percent. And, uh, I don't think I actually realized that until I listened to your interview with, uh, Becky XL, um, and her, you know, talking about that people would send her like, you know, pages and pages of, you know, their story. Mm. And, um, and although that's amazing that they feel like they can come to you and chat to you about that and share that. And I always try to get back to every single DM on Instagram. Like uh, I will be, you know, while that's happening, um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of like taken away from like what I'm doing at home. You know, like I, I, my wife can see me like on my phone, although I feel like I'm helping someone else. Like my, 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 you know, kids might be like yelling at me like dada, dada, like, and I'm like, Oh crap. Like just put the phone yeah. down for a second. Like, but I feel like, um, not that it's my job, but that I feel this need to be there for, for these people. Like it just, it draws me in like so much because I don't want them to feel like what I felt like when I was first diagnosed, like just super alone, super isolated, like in a massive dark hole. Um, but yeah, at the same time, like I think it perpetuates what you're going through yourself. Like it really ramps it up a bit when you hear mm. someone's, um, you know, negative experience with say, you know, medical professionals. Um, and it can, not warp your view, but also it can take your brain in a train of thought where, you know, you may have had a really great experience with something and then someone might, um, you know, say otherwise. And I've found this happens so many times. Like I've been to restaurants where I've had a really great experience and then someone will go there and say, they didn't really, you know, understand like gluten or like, you know, they didn't understand the cross-contamination aspects mm. of the restaurant. And I, might, and I might say like, oh, that's so weird. Like they were so good with me and they explained everything, but different staff can, you know, change. They can have different owners come in. Um, so it, and it's a really difficult space to be in as well because you're offering, you know, I, I always say at the beginning of every podcast episode that I do, I'm not offering, you know, um, advice to anybody, health advice, and for them to always seek out their own personal medical advice. But it's a tricky space to be in where you want to help mm. people, but you're also are only sharing your own experience and what works for me might not work for them. And so it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's super tricky. And, th and then with the good experiences as well, that can rub off too. If someone says like, oh, you know, I found that this tip really helped me when I had celiac disease. And like, I was able to prep in this way when I went overseas for travel and you might be like, oh, wow, like I've never even thought of that. That's awesome. But yeah, it can yeah. work in the positives and negatives. You can take that on. Um, yeah. A fair bit. It's really interesting ground, isn't it? Yeah. I remember like one experience I was like, I shared like a, a restaurant um, in London. It was like Italian. And I remember like the comments was like, well, they've got nuts on the dessert, but I'm like, well, if you actually, I ate there, the nuts are like in the fridge and they're tucked away and I'm, I don't eat desserts anyway. And it's, <laughs> it's really interesting because there's, there's always going to be one person, but like, well, there's, there's nuts on the menu. It's like, well, I've got to eat out and like not every restaurant and a lot of restaurants do have nuts in the kitchen tucked away somewhere. So, and, and it's interesting what you, you mentioned there about like the Becky at cell. And I was thinking about this the other, the other day, you know, um, the conversation we had, you know, when we kind of like, we touched upon it there where we was talking about that toll of like taking everyone else's like experiences on as well. And um, mm. there's part of me, which like afterwards, like felt a bit bad about that, which I shouldn't do. Cause I felt bad. I was like, Oh, does it mean like, I don't care about my audience or the community? And it wasn't that it was just like, 
imagine like getting like five messages a day and like and it's all about them sharing their experience with you then like you said i think it's just finding them boundaries and i think the more mm. I've opened and spoke about this if the more like other content creators have come forward and be like oh my god i feel this way but i've never spoke about it before and i thought it was like a me problem i i just felt a bit bad because if i thought oh my god like well i'm just pushing these people away i'm i'm not bothered about them which is the opposite end it's literally like it's just a lot to kind of take on at times like no, nah, yeah, you mentioned a word there too, boundaries. And I think um, I'm still trying to find that because I've never been in, in this situation where, you know, like I think you have like twice the amount of followers that I have and like I can't keep up with what I'm doing. Like it's it, it's crazy to try to get back to the amount of DMs. Like it would be like a full-time job to try to reply to all the DMs and answer all the questions mm. and follow up with everybody and and the emails and and um like you know like different guests and stuff and we we talked about before we started recording there like just the amount of time that goes into a podcast like you know how much work goes into it as well there's that level of it too um but yeah i don't think you'd like anybody should ever feel bad about being upfront about that because it is just what you're going through and you can only you know sort of do what you can do with the time that you have um and yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you can only handle what yeah. you can handle and being upfront about it. Like, you know, um, when you had that conversation with Becky XL, like that's just what she's going through and it's good for her followers to know that, you know, like, cause some people might feel like they can just reach out to her and just chat to her at any time and wonder why she's not, you know, replying. Um, but she, you know, she and so many people are like super busy people and there's nothing, you know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with I mean, yeah, not getting back to people. I was going to touch upon obviously having, a podcast then like how do you manage that because obviously you've also got a full-time job as well Ben yeah I do so um yeah got the full-time job um doing a bit more of like the stay-at-home dad thing as well now so I'm doing that at the beginning of the week for two days a, a week and um yeah my wife has recently taken on a different role with her work and uh so she's working more than I am now which is um it's it's very different and I'm trying to find the dynamic of how that's working because I have always pretty much like worked full time, started up my own business. Um, and now just trying to find that different dynamic of that as well as like, you know, keeping the podcast going. And I find that I have way, way more respect for my wife. Um, not that I didn't before, but just the level of work that it takes to just parents in general. Um, as well as just survive in the meantime and just keep a job down, um, you know, not mentally and physically wreck yourself. And I felt like that's where I was getting to pretty much last year. Um, and that's why I was so happy for my wife to take on this job. Like she's been working towards that for ages. But yeah, to like, so I'm doing like the stay at home dad thing, running my own business and running a podcast. Like it's, um, yeah, it's, it's hard. Like it's, it's super hard. And hence like why I am like getting back to like DMS and stuff at really like weird times. Um, and just doing my best with that side of things, but also just trying not to, not to burn myself out in the meantime, but it's just something that like, I'm super, super passionate about. Um, and why I do spend like so much spare time doing it because, like the gluten-free community like have helped me massively, massively. Like um, I cannot really like emphasize how much it's helped to just connect with others and especially like overseas, um, but you know, within Australia so much as well, but just to feel so like connected to a community. And uh, I often say this on my own podcast, like I've been in bands in the past, like in really niche musical communities, like metal and punk and, you know, alternative rock sort of stuff. Um, and I feel like the gluten-free community is sort of that for me. Like we, whenever we get together, we're like, oh yeah, like getting gluten and, you know, talking about yeah. crap and stuff all the time. And like, it's just, it, you f like, I feel like there is no conversation that's off limits with them and we can just connect with yeah. that straight away. And it's, yeah, so cool when you find that um, in life in general. It's interesting because you... Yeah, because you kind of connect with them on on, on a, a deeper level sometimes. Because obviously, like you obviously both live with, for example, my, my instances allergies. But then, 
yeah it's it's nice and to have that kind of community around you which kind of help you through it i mean do you get a chance to meet many people from the community do you have like many kind of al- um kind of al- algae or kind of celiac events in um, australia just had one just had one uh when was oh, it wow. yeah the end of last month and um i got invited by celiac australia to interview their ceo and so we sat down, um, had a chat about what's happening at Celiac Australia and the news and um, events and, you know, um, where they're wanting to take Celiac Australia in the future. And they have a new C- CEO now. And it was really awesome to sit down with her and just chat about the direction they want to take it in. And it's it's a great direction too. And they're on to some fantastic stuff. But yeah, g- going to that expo was just bonkers. Um, it's the first one I've been to because I missed the first one. I think, uh, I don't think we could get up there cause there's like crazy floods here. And, um, and one of them, oh, wow. okay. uh, there was COVID. So there was like COVID lockdowns and it got postponed or something. So yeah, this was the first year I was able to go and I met, it was just crazy. Like meeting so many people, like off Instagram, we'd been like DMing and, you know, yeah. just chatting for ages and it's like, Oh, what? Um, and just meeting like guests of the podcast too, in real life, uh, it's like, you know, cookbook authors and, you know, um, you know, just different people who have done heaps in the celiac and gluten-free space. And like, I would walk past someone and they're like, oh, hey, Ben. And I'm like, oh, hey, <laughs> like, it's just, it was just the, the weirdest experience. That, that's happened to me. Bef- yeah. You had the yeah, same thing like, them, like free from festivals or. Yeah, we have one in like London and it like travels around the UK, like Birmingham, like Liverpool and like Glasgow. And um, it's been times where someone's like, like hey, Dan, I'm like, and you're just trying to put like, Yes. Trying to put a name to the yeah. face, and then the, this, and then they say the page. You're like, oh yeah, I know who you are now. But sometimes yeah. it's just like my mind goes like blank when someone says my name. I'm like, um, where have we met? <laughs> um, I found it. I was like, going to ask um, about oh, obviously, sorry. yeah. No, yeah, go it was, it, so. it, yeah, it was just like, it, like it was, it was such a good day. It was awesome. But it like, at the same time was like, whoa, like it was a lot all at once to like, you know, to Take do the it. interview and then, yeah, to like meet like all these people in, in real life. Um, it was great though. It was, yeah, it was awesome. I love to kind of like hear about obviously your story of how you got diagnosed because obviously you got diagnosed with obviously see like oh you found out you you had to obviously a bit later on in life can we talk about the 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 bug which your daughter had and how that opened up many kind of doors for you you could say you call it the gastro the gastro bug is that correct yeah gastro bug yeah um so it was a gastro bug that yeah my daughter caught um from daycare and she's probably like a year old or something at this stage and then it was during COVID actually. So 20, yeah, 2020, the beginning of 2020. And I initially thought it was COVID like when we, when we all caught it. Um, and yeah, it was, I think my wife and I, sorry, my wife and my daughter got better, like super quick. Like they were better in maybe like three or four days, but I just had all these lingering symptoms. Um, and at first it was just, you know, like, heaps of diarrhea and vomiting and just all that GI stuff. Um, but later on it it just like, I'd get better for like a couple of weeks and then it would just reoccur. So I just feel like I was getting, you know, infected with this gastro bug again and again and again. And I kept on going back to my GP for every like month or so, every couple of weeks. And I said, this is just, it keeps on happening. I don't know what's going on with my gut. Uh, I can't pinpoint it. And so she did like, they didn't seem too worried at the time. And they, you know, sent me for um, like MRIs and CTs and uh, blood tests and ultrasounds, like the works basically, like every test under the sun. Um, And the only thing that came back was slight markers on my liver. Um, And they basically said, you know, that's to be expected. You've been through the gastro bug. It's just been, you know, it's wreaking havoc on your body. Just give it time, maybe take some probiotics or something. And, uh, and you know, just basically just, it'll sort itself out. But during this time, like I was getting, I was getting all these other symptoms, like super weird symptoms, like just brain fog so badly, like could not think about anything. Even the smallest task to like write my name down would be, it's really hard. Um, I just, yeah, I'd get muddled up with everything at work. 
couldn't think about what I was doing, couldn't make dinner. Um, and it was just a, yeah, I just became like a mess and I had all these like joint pains and back pains, um, and the stomach pain, like I could, I really cannot explain it other than like yeah. someone stabbing a knife, like repeatedly into the stomach. And like, I would just be hauled over in pain. I was taking so many pain meds too and, uh, losing weight. I think that was the biggest thing, like losing weight, like crazy. So I lost nearly, I think it was around 10 kilos from the point of like at beginning of 2020 wow. to when I was diagnosed in, lot, yeah. finally in December. Yeah. So in that, that period lost about 10 kilos. So I was just really gaunt, frail, um, and looking horrible. Uh, and it was only when our friend who was diagnosed in 2019, she was chatting to my wife and she was like, maybe you should get tested for this thing called celiac disease. It sounds like you got a lot of the symptoms. And, uh, and my wife said, why don't you ask you, you know, go and ask your doctor. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, they've tested for everything. I really don't think it'll be that. Um, so I went and got, I think I put it off. Actually, I um, was keeping a food journal at this time and I went gluten-free just by chance because I was that desperate at that point. I was like, I'm going to keep a food journal. I swear it's food. And so I noticed that like yeah. pastas, breads, pizzas, um, you know, an ice cream and beer, they would be the things that would really flare me up and I'd be in that pain the next day. So I was like, I swear it's diet related. So I went back to my so doctor. So it wasn't, it wasn't just like, it wasn't just like blow in it. It's actually like pain if you, if you had these things. Like super, super bad pain and really random yeah. too. So it would, I couldn't pinpoint what was going on. It'd just come out, you know, come about just randomly throughout the day. Um, so yeah, I, I put off getting that, that test done, um, and kept the food journal and I took this to my doctor. I said, like, I had this, you know, food journal that I was keeping and I said, maybe it's food. It could be diet related. And they're like, I really doubt it would be diet related. Um, so keep on your same diet. Do not exclude anything from your diet because that can be really harmful for your health. And I really should have listened to that. Um, but I didn't. And I just by chance went gluten-free and started taking out dairy and a whole heap of other stuff. And then finally, I actually asked my my GP because I was just getting you know fed up with it at that stage, kept on getting this pain, dropping the weight. And I said, do you think we can test for celiac for this thing called celiac disease? And they sort of like looked on the computer um, and was thinking about it and said, do you know what? You do have slight markers on your liver. That could be an indication. Um, look, we may as well. We've done everything else. When got the blood tests um, after having to, and they said you had to ingest gluten for a little while before getting the blood test. And so I went and did that. Oh, really? um, and those couple of days or that week, like leading up to it, when I was ingesting gluten, I was on death's door. Like I was so so bad like i could not get out of bed it was horrible so i took myself off got the blood test straight away um the gp pretty much rang me the next day and was like you have to come in chat to me i'm like oh crap like i probably have oh, like yeah. cancer so it's, you know something going on and they said uh like you know sat down the doctors i was like okay you you know you're looking pretty serious like what what's going on um and she said yeah it looks like you are you are severely celiac um, and you need to go on this thing called a gluten challenge. And initially I was like, what is a gluten challenge? <laughs> like what, like, what is that? It sounds like an yeah. ice bucket challenge what or something this? like, yeah. Do I go on TikTok yeah. or something? Um, Put and on she top said, of your heads, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she said, you got to ingest gluten for a period of six weeks. Then you have a uh, scope go down into your small bowel. They take a biopsy of your small bowel and then confirm whether you have celiac disease seen by the damage um, by these things called villi, which get blunted when you're ingesting gluten. And that's how they truly confirm that you have celiac disease. And I said, what? Like you want me to ingest this thing, which is like known as poison into my body for six weeks. I'm not doing it. And, and they basically said, yeah. You, that's that's the pathway that you have to go down to get the gold standard to know for sure because they said otherwise you are going on a gluten-free diet for life and that is i'm going to tell you right now that is a big change to make in your life and you have to be 
really strict with it. And, um, and I said, okay. Um, and they said, look, you're going to have to take off work for a couple of weeks. I was like, I own my own business and this is the lead up to Christmas. Like I, yeah. I can't do that. What I don't have the ability. Do? Yeah. yeah. I can't do that. Um, and they said, look, this is, it's going to be rough. It's going to be pretty rough, but the more you, you ingest gluten, it's going to get a bit easier. And I had to ramp it up, um, for like, yeah, it was like six or seven weeks in the lead up to the endoscopy and then wow. got it done. Uh, the, the, ga- <laughs> the, the gastro surgeon, basically before I went in for the endoscopy, he said, uh, you've got celiac, like you, your markers <laughs> are literally off the charts. Like I'm just checking that you don't yeah. have any serious damage from ingesting gluten for a long time, and they did the biopsy. Um, yeah, had confirmed celiac, and then what would, yeah went gluten free. What would the consequences? What would the consequences be if like you did have serious marks on your on your insides? I like, you know obviously like you was okay. Would there be like serious consequences to that if you did damage your? Is it your liver? Yeah, yeah, you can get liver markers. So there's, you can do some serious damage um, from undiagnosed celiac. Hence why I'm so like passionate about speaking about people getting tested if they haven't before. Um, you can have between, it's something ridiculous, like 250 to 300 known symptoms. Like it's just so broad. And some people can be asymptomatic, but you can get anything from, lactose intolerance to, uh, osteoporosis, um, to infertility, to anemia, um, severe oh, wow. neurological issues, um, and even some forms of lymphomas and cancers. Like if it's not picked up and you go undiagnosed for a really long time. Um, and yeah, the earlier that they pick it up, the better chances you have of not being at risk for all of those health issues down the track. Uh, but yeah, and it can affect the liver as well. It can do all sorts of things. Um, it can be, you know, you can be at more risk for diabetes as well. Their sister autoimmune diseases are lots, lots of other autoimmune diseases as well. And, um, yeah, it can turn into some nasty stuff if you don't get diagnosed and are on a strict gluten-free diet if you have it. How was that then the kind of transition obviously from, obviously being able to eat gluten to obviously cutting out like completely was that was it quite tough I imagine even later on in life as well like because obviously like, I'd, I've heard of people get diagnosed with allergies and they've got to stop eating what they, they used to eat I imagine like it must be it must have been quite a challenge obviously now stopping it 100% then yeah like everything you know um everything just completely changed like the entire setup um at home as well it was during covid and i guess you like there's no perfect time to be diagnosed with with celiac but during that time i was at home the entire time so my wife and i just researched the absolute hell out of everything to do with celiac disease and the gluten-free diet. And we decided at the time, because I was just sort of getting into cooking and baking at the time, uh, just prior to my diagnosis. And I was really enjoying that. Um, and so we decided to pretty much go nearly hundred percent gluten-free in the house, but my wife and my girls still have, you know, like their gluten containing foods, their cereals, their, you know, treats and biscuits and stuff. And, just a few other, you know, and bread as well. That's still in the freezer, gluten containing bread. We keep everything else um, gluten free in the kitchen just because there's a couple of reasons. <laughs> and this is everybody's personal choice, but I am so clumsy at the best of times. Like I will just, you know, like even when, before I was a parent, like I would just, you know, walk around and like eat random stuff, you know, that's just laying around on the kitchen bench or like go <laughs> grab something out of the fridge. That's or, like me. Yeah, they yeah. call me the Hoover, like, because yeah. <laughs> I literally just like eat anything in sight. Like, they literally like yesterday, like my girlfriend's mum and her boyfriend was like, "You just eat the whole kitchen." I, like, because I'll be in the kitchen like every like two hours, just putting like food in. I, I don't know. There's my. It's because I'm so tall. I think I'm just like eat, 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 eat. 
Yeah, you probably have that metabolism too that you can just sort of like, yeah, yeah, just metabolize it really quickly. <laughs> but it down, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sort of the same way. Like I've always loved my food and I'll just like kind of peck on, you know, things that are out. And so that's one of the reasons. But also that, yeah, I was just getting into the cooking and baking side of stuff. And I said to my wife, you know, like I really – really want to make food for our girls. And I want to see them as well, like see both parents making food. Um, I guess, cause I didn't really have that growing up. Um, both my parents, they, they love, they love their food, but they're just not like really into cooking and, and baking and that side of things. Um, and, but I wanted to see, you know, our kids, you know, both parents, both mum and dad just getting into the kitchen and, and, um, and seeing that, you know, modeled to them so that, you know, they know that, you know, anybody can get into the kitchen and cook anything up. And I think like, I often say that to my, um, like any, any of my like Instagram followers, or if they DM me like for a recipe, or if they say how I went with a dish, you know, my wife makes heaps of food too, but like, whenever I give something a go, like it's trial and error. And I am like constantly trying to get that recipe right. And I've found with, yeah. you know, the gluten-free side of things, you got to stick to the recipe. I've tried to like, you know, just exchange a few <laughs> ingredients for other it. stuff. You can't, no, you just, you got to kind of stick to yeah. it until you get the swing of it. But um, yeah, uh, it's, it's been a massive change. I think socially has been the biggest thing. And I'm sure that you've found this with yeah, having, um, having allergies as well. Like just being out with your mates and, um, you know, them try like trying to get across to them how serious it is. And uh, like a lot of my mates do understand it now, but it's taken time for them to really understand what like I've actually been through and what we were talking about before, having that open space to really talk about that and be open about that and that it has been a huge life change and mentally and physically. Um, but just the mental toll that it takes – you know, to avoid gluten to the next level. And as you said, you, you know, there's that anxiety that follows you around no matter what you're going out to a restaurant, you're going to catch up with, you know, friends or family and you're sitting down there and no matter if you're having the best time and, you know, everything's going great. There's still that little thing in the back of your head. If it isn't a 100% gluten-free, you know, um, restaurant or cafe that, okay, there's a chance that yeah. I could get sick here. There's always that chance. And it's in the back of your head there somewhere. And it's a level of anxiety that you can sort of bring under control. But at the same time, it's there. Um, and certain things I'm sure you found can accentuate that. And you keep on asking questions. And yes. then it's, you you try to read the person's mind that you're speaking to. And it's like, do you really <laughs> understand how serious, you know? Do you get it? Yeah. 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 And you, you question it. How much is like, even... Yeah. I much it's even hard like being celiac because I th I think more people be aware about allergies than celiac. Um, I, I might I might be wrong actually because I've celiac because I'm massive space, but I feel like in a restaurant if I speak to the staff, they probably understand allergies more than celiac because I was completely unaware about the celiac space until speaking with yourself and speaking with all the different people like within the the in, in industry. But yeah, I imagine it's like really hard like. Can I ask you, like, when you rock up to a restaurant or a cafe, what's the first thing that you say? Do you say, I have anaphylaxis and I'm allergic to, to is it nuts that, you, that you're allergic to? Yeah, so so mine's, mine's an allergy. So when I kind of go to a restaurant, I would pick what I want to eat first. And then once I order it, but like, um, sometimes I've got the allergy menu, like it's like indicated on the main menu. This isn't always the case. Sometimes I'm like, have you got an allergy menu? Um, or sometimes if it's something quite simple, I'll be like, look, I want to order this, but can you just double check with the chef? It's definitely got no nuts. I've got severe nut allergy. Can you cross check it um, with the chef or make sure they've got an allergy menu? I try and do both. If you can get the allergy menu and then get them to check with the chef, then it's it's kind of like set in stone then like they're definitely aware. Um, I found it was quite actually quite, it was better when I went to Dublin in Ireland because they had all the main allergens on the main menu. So then I didn't have to then ask for an allergy menu on top of the main menu, which obviously it's just easier to be like, yes, I can have this, I can't have this. 
mm. but they they was really good. I was actually really surprised. Like, I need to speak about this on the Instagram, but they they was much better than London, I think. That's really good. That's that's good that there's a an awareness mm. around it because um, I'm sure you found this too that there's certain places that have a better grasp on it than others and that you feel super confident about. And when you find those places too, you're like, oh yeah, like they're my yeah. go-tos now. Um, I'll keep on going back to them and share the word about it too. Yeah, I don't know why restaurants like don't take like um, allergies and see that more serious because they're, they're just going to get repeated customers. And like you say, yeah. like once you have like a really good experience somewhere, you're just going to keep going time and time again. But I just find that like, some places like just don't take it serious as like, well, I'm never ever going to eat there again. Like, so it's just like them experiences. Like there's like a, a Mexican place in London I had an amazing experience there. So I know if I want Mexican, I'll just keep going back to the same restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, once, once you find those safe spaces, it just makes like a massive, massive difference. Um, but like, yeah, I guess, yeah, you mentioned it there, but it, because there isn't that immediate reaction with people with celiac disease. It totally varies. Like someone could react, you know, in a couple of minutes or someone could react hours later or even a day later or later. Um, and then the symptoms just totally vary. That's what makes it super hard to, you know, spread awareness about it when different people, you know, are reacting differently and also how people treat it too, like how they express mm. it themselves. So like you could have, a, you know, a person with celiac disease like myself go into the restaurant, ask all the questions. Um, I'm like, I go to the nth degree. Like I ask, you know, do you have it, you know, um, separate fryers? Uh, do you, you know, keep your gluten containing food away from your other, um, gluten containing food? Um, and you know, like I, I go, I go next level and I ask all those questions. And so the staff are like, yeah, like, and I imagine it's quite, you know, they're a bit anxious about it too, when they're, when they have a person come in with dietaries like that and they're like, okay, I need to take this super seriously. But then another person with celiac disease may come in or just say that they're gluten-free and it might just be for a lifestyle reason. And they will order the gluten-free on, thing on the menu. Mm. And those staff might be like, oh, okay, so you need it in a separate fryer. And, and, blah. and they're like, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, pop it in the separate fryer. That'd be great. And then they order a beer or they order the gluten dessert on yeah. the side. And it's like, you have just totally reversed everything that that person knows about this disease. That's mm. where the, the problem sort of lies with it. Um, and I'm sure there's similar things with the allergy community that maybe – like people um, like don't take it as seriously as some, but is, is there that normal reaction where someone, yeah. if they do have anaphylaxis, then they will sort of react in a certain way? Yeah. I think like, obviously mine's like anaphylaxis. I've, I've always been all right. like eat, eat, you know, obviously I've had like bad experiences and stuff, but I think, for me, like the best experiences is when they have like a friend or family member with allergies. Mm. Then they have that personal connection. So for example, I ordered pizza and I could see that one of the pizzas in this restaurant had like pesto on it. So I thought rather than speaking to the guy behind the bar, I didn't really like get it. So I was like, ah, oh, I'm just going to go straight to the kitchen because it's like an open pan kitchen. And I grabbed mm. one of the guys and went, oh, I can come over. I was like, look, I've ordered a margarita pizza. Can you just make sure you don't use the same cutter because I've got severe nut allergy? And I uh, is a pizza fine for my for my peanut nut allergy? And he was like, Yeah. Um originally he said, um, no, like the tomato base has got may contain, but he's like, I can mm. just make you one on the own. So I was like, that's fine. And then um he was like, Oh, my friend has a nut allergy and he eats here all the time. So then that was like super like reassuring then. I was like, Well, his friend's got a nut allergy. He cuts for his friend, um, and that really like my anxiety went down then, which is nice. But I mean it's not often that happens. <laughs> Yeah, I've found that too. Like if they have like a friend or a family member that has celiac disease and 
yeah, they just totally take it way more seriously. And as soon as they say that, um, it just makes me feel way more confident. Like we went to a wedding actually a couple of uh, months ago and uh, the waitress going around was saying, oh, you know, um, can, you know, they were just handing out the platters before the, the, uh, the main event and, um, and having like, you know, the dinner and everything. And they were just going around with these starters. And I said, oh, is, is this one gluten-free? And she said, oh, do you have celiac? And I said, yeah, I, I do actually. Um, and I was <laughs> like, just happy that she asked uh, that she didn't just say, oh, yeah. okay, you want the gluten-free one. Um, she said, oh no, my sister's got celiac disease. I'm going to make, take this super seriously. I'll make sure everybody, you know, they change everything that they put some gloves yeah. on when they get everything out. I'll make sure everything's separate. It'll be totally fine for you. Um, and we'll keep everything wrapped up separately and just make sure it's all good. And all mains and desserts are taken care of too. We've got that sorted in the kitchen. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like you don't need to go through that script. Like, it, uh, like yeah, that anxiety yeah, just sort of like- You can enjoy the night pull, then. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, a massive otherwise you're just like constantly, yeah, otherwise like you're constantly like, you, you, you're panicking, you've got the stress of like, well, there's loads of new people, so I've got to say hello. And then obviously then there's the stress of like, oh, I've got this allergy. And then sometimes I, like, I, I think like I'm a bit quiet in social settings sometimes. And it's, it's because of like the anxiety of like, I'm in a restaurant, am I gonna have a allergic reaction, am I not? And that on top of your mind and everything else. Um, yeah, I definitely need to learn how to make sure them thoughts are not there so I can actually enjoy the evening. But it can, yeah, it's, it's really, really tricky at times. I'd highly recommend, I, I know it's different. It's celiac disease and the gluten-free diet, but I yeah. really recommend um, that episode I did with um, Juliet Thompson, the psychologist uh, that I've, I've listened to that like three times personally and plus the editing and, you know, like all the um, uh, just, you know, proof listening to it and everything. I've listened to it a lot now, mm. but those tips that she gave, I think they apply for a lot of stuff. Um, other dietaries Amazing. as well, as well as celiac disease and the gluten-free diet. It really um, sort of like hit home um, for me in, in a lot of ways. And I think that like she just gives some great general tips around struggling with food anxiety uh, in, in general. So um, yeah, yeah, check it out for sure. Yeah, I'll definitely make sure to check that out like next week or this week because yeah, it's something I've yeah, I've been, I, I was going to do a post about it, like either today or tomorrow, but it's something I've really like struggled with recently, mm. like mm. them kind of thoughts and like, is it, is it not on it? Yeah. You can all get like a bit, a bit overwhelming at times. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can totally relate to like just sitting there as well. Like just, you know, and just being quiet um, and not talking and people can sometimes take that as like, what the hell? This dude's like a bit, you know? Um, rude or you know doesn't want to engage in this conversation but you just don't know that the brain is just like am I going to get like cross-contamination from this meal overdrive uh, it just sits there yeah yeah it's been an absolute pleasure Ben to have you on the podcast today kind of share your your experience like your podcast obviously celiac diagnosis obviously the mental health implications of that and like how we're, our mind sometimes goes into overdrive would you like to share your kind of page and podcast um, on making tape yeah, absolutely, man. So, um, yeah, my Instagram page is a gluten-free family. Um, I couldn't get that name when I, you know, signed up for the Instagram page. So it's like a dot G F oh, really? family is our handle. Yeah. Um, and our podcast, it's super easy to find. That's why I created the name. I did, um, a gluten-free podcast and you can find that on any podcasting app. Um, and yeah, if you want to email me a gluten-free family at gmail.com and, uh, yeah, totally happy to speak to anybody. I love connecting with, you know, people with celiac disease and people on, you know, a gluten-free diet for other reasons, but also, you know, chatting to people like yourself with other dietaries. I think the same sort of thing applies, like we've been talking about just navigating life with, with other dietary requirements that, um, you know, all our paths kind of converge, I think. So uh, yeah, thanks Heath for having me on, man. It's been really great to chat with you today.